a little bit more sensitive, but we can have a look at it for the moment. I'm going to try and use the clicker. It might be a disaster, but we'll, oh, here we go. Does it go back as well? Okay, we'll leave it there. There we go. Lovely. Nice to be here. Um, we've been away for most of the summer weekend, so it feels like we've been completely AWOL, but um, it's really nice to, to be back, and it's really nice to be speaking to you today from God's Word. Um, if we've not met, my name is Andy. Um, I'm married to Harriet, and we have been at Manor Road, I think for, I'm going to say, exactly a year. I'm going to say this is our, our one-year anniversary. Um, so it's lovely to be here and to share God's Word with us this morning. Um, as we begin, let's open uh, our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 22. If you don't have a Bible, um, stick your hand up. I'm sure someone can grab you one. Have one there. Anyone else for a Bible? One over here as well. Lovely. Just stick your hand up and thanks, John. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 22. Let me just pray for us and then we can read. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it breathes uh, life and truth into uh, our hearts and to our lives, into this world. Thank you um, that you speak to us. Please help us to listen today. Uh, help me to speak faithfully from your word. Um, and would your Holy Spirit be at work in our hearts to apply these truths uh, as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while well, he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I love riddles, paradoxes, that kind of thing. Um, that bit of a hint for the, for the picture on the screen, try and make sense of that. Um, sorry if you don't like them, but I thought we'd have a start with uh, a couple of riddles. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, you might have heard it before. What gets wetter the more it dries? Anyone know? What gets wetter the more it dries? A towel. Correct. Love that one. It's a classic. Here's one I hadn't heard before. I like it though. The more you take, the more you leave behind. The more you take, the more you leave behind. What am I? Any thought? He's got it. Anyone else? He's just whispered it, Stanley. Go on, say it a bit louder. Footsteps. Very good. I enjoyed that one. Um, here are a few more paradox I, paradoxes I enjoy thinking about. Deep down, you're really shallow. That's one Harriet says to me, actually. Um, if I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. That's what she says about me. Never say never. Ooh, just said it. Never say never. And have a. Have a so you can get your head around this one. The next sentence is false. The first sentence is true. Just let your mind to try and work that one out for a second. Well, why are we talking about riddles and paradoxes? Well, partly because, as I say, I love them, um, but also because I think there's something a bit paradoxical about what we're going to look at today. And that's the topic of doubt, um, particularly what I want to call Christian doubt. Christian doubt, that is when believers are caused to have doubts. Straight away, that might sound like a paradox to you. Can Christians doubt? We'll use the section we read out in Matthew as our main passage for today. Um, but let me just read to you possibly my favorite verse, 
that talks about doubt, which actually comes from the book of Jude. No need to turn there. Um, it's a really simple verse. I'll put it on the screen. Jude writes this. Be merciful to those who doubt. Be merciful to those who doubt. That tells us two things straight off. One, doubting is expected. Doubting is expected. And two, doubt should be talked about. Firstly, doubting is expected. Doubt is a normal part of the Christian life. If it wasn't, then Jude, Jude wouldn't have wasted time uh, addressing it. He's got a very small letter, and he decided to address the topic of doubt. It's expected. That sudden feeling of, what if none of it is true? Or a life circumstance that makes you ask, why did God let that happen? Or a lie of Satan saying, would God really save you? These things are part and parcel of living as a Christian in a broken world. See, sometimes we, we confuse doubt with unbelief. We think that to have doubts about our faith is to no longer be a Christian at all. But that's not the Bible's take on it. Let me read what one theologian writes. He says, if ours is an examined faith, we should be unafraid to doubt. If doubting is eventually justified, we were believing what clearly wasn't worth believing. But if doubt is answered, our faith has grown stronger. It knows God more certainly, and it can enjoy God more deeply. In other words, no matter how strong our faith is, at some point we may experience doubt. But instead of it being a sign of weakness, doubt can actually be something that causes us to dig deeper into our relationship with God. It can even make our faith stronger. Doubting your faith can strengthen your faith. It's another paradox for you. Martin Luther, a very famous Christian, he was once described as a man of great faith and a man of great doubt. These things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, we even saw at the end of our passage in Matthew, the disciples are worshipping Jesus and seeing him for, for who he really is at the end of this. Doubting is to be expected, uh, and doubting should also be talked about. For us to be merciful to those who doubt, as Jude says, it requires doubt to be talked about. Jude expects doubt not to be hidden away or a taboo subject, but to be known in the community of believers. Otherwise, we're left isolated and vulnerable. Someone's described doubt like this. I wonder if you can relate to it. Doubt came with the unexpectedness and disorientation of a mugger, partly because I had never heard anyone talk about it. Lust, pride, greed, self-reliance, anger, impatience. These were known enemies, planned for and expected. Doubt was not. I was a bullet-wounded soldier who had never heard of guns. I think that's a good way of putting it. And it shows the necessity of addressing the topic, I think. If a soldier does not know about the power and destructive force of a gun, they are not prepared for life as a soldier. If a Christian does not know about the power and destructive force of doubt, they are not prepared for life as a Christian. So why don't we talk about doubt? Have a little think. Well, perhaps out of shame or embarrassment, out of fear about what others might think or say. Um, maybe it's just that it's an awkward topic, brings up awkward questions we'd rather not tackle. But far from receiving rebuke or humiliation, Jude is saying that believers who doubt should find mercy. Tenderness and care is the order of proceedings. So in the knowledge that doubting is to be expected and doubting should be talked about, I want to spend the next 20 minutes or so digging into this topic. Um, we're going to think about doubt as uh, a journey through a forest, a gloomy forest. Gosh, that's even gloomier than I expected it to be. <laughs> you have to take my word that that is a forest that I've, I've found a picture of. A gloomy forest, because doubt is a gloomy place to be. And we're going to imagine the paths that lead into the forest of doubt. There are many, and they're mysterious. They circle around. They flip from one to the other. There are also many ways out of the forest of doubt, um, which are equally um, mysterious and many. We're going to have a little think about um, what it feels like to be in the, in the forest of doubt when the trees are kind of uh, branching right overhead and blocking out all the, all the light 
can feel like a very dark place to be. Um, some of us are in the forest of doubt for uh, just a few, few seconds or a few uh, weeks. Some of us, um, it's a journey that lasts many months or, or many years. And for some of us, that might be a place where we're in right now. Well, the next 20 minutes won't offer the, the quick fix we often crave, um, but I hope it will encourage us that we're not alone in this uh, and offer some direction of where we can look to in some times of doubt. Um, at the very least, it will show us afresh how Jesus responds to us when we're in this place. Um, so we're going to start by looking at some of the pathways into the forest of doubt. What are the different ways in which we are caused uh, to doubt as Christians? Well, maybe uh, the one we immediately think of might be intellectual doubt. Intellectual doubt, doubt. This type of doubt that comes when we wonder if the facts our beliefs are based upon can actually be backed up with evidence. I guess it's the first doubt in the Bible. It's the doubt that the snake sowed into the mind of Eve in the garden when he said to her, did God really say? Can I really trust the Bible? Or it's the doubt of, of Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, who said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. We might think, did Jesus really rise from the grave? I need to see the evidence. Intellectual doubt. But there's more. There's, there's also what I've called emotional doubt. Emotional doubt. Doubt that is not caused by a, a nagging question, maybe, but by circumstance. Let me read verses 29 and 30 from Matthew 15 again. Have a look down. Verse 29 and 30. Thanks, Pe is it? Thanks so much. Matthew 14. Yeah. Thanks so much, Harriet. Matthew 14. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Peter starts to doubt, not because of uh, an intellectual question, but because he sees the ferocity of the wind and the waves, and he's overcome with fear. Can Jesus save me from this? We can be similar. Lord, are you really in control? Because I'm afraid of the terrible things that can happen, might happen to me, might happen to my loved ones. Still another path might be self-doubt. Self-doubt, a, a lack of assurance that we really are saved. Um, maybe we keep praying that believer's prayer over and over because we're not sure that we've said it properly. Is God listening? Am I really a Christian? Lord, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Or maybe we look at our life and, and think my sin is just too much. Even if I am a Christian, God wouldn't let someone like me in, would he? There's one final path I want to touch on brie briefly. Uh, I've called it disobedient doubt. Disobedient doubts. That is doubt that flows from disobeying God's word. Um, sin, in other words. We can think again of Eve in the garden who looks at the fruit and sees it as pleasing to the eye and desirable to make one wise. And as a result, she thinks back to the, the snake's earlier doubt of God's goodness and she lends it more weight. Maybe God isn't all good. That fruit does look delicious. Sin can distort our outlook on life to the extent that we start doubting the truth and trusting the doubt. I think of my friend Rob from university. Um, he came to university fresh as a Christian. Uh, lots of questions, uh, but keen to follow Jesus. Uh, in, until his desire to fit in with the crowd, uh, to go out drinking and to sleep with whoever he wanted to, it tipped the balance for him. And, and now the doubts were double as convincing and Jesus half worth following. It kind of highlights the seriousness of doubt. Um, now there might be someone here today who is, feels like they're in a similar position, not wanting to give your whole life to Jesus because of what you, want, what you may have to give up, and that's causing you to sit on the fence, to lend more weight to your doubts. Friend, this is not the path to life. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, what good is it to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? 
Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. So we've looked at a few of the pathways into the forest of doubt. Um, Let's flip the picture. Let's keep talking about this. I've only scratched the surface, but let's just flip the picture into the pathways out of doubt. There's a bit of a brighter picture for us. Let's have a look at the three um, most trustworthy pathways out of the forest of doubt. We can always turn to these three options. Number one, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Listen to these words from Hebrews 4. Put them on the screen for us. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Let me read that again. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. However we're feeling, we can always run to Jesus in prayer and we'll find mercy and grace, not condemnation. And we can be assured of this when uh, we read of Jesus' life in the Gospels. Um, Let's look back down our passage, Matthew 14. Um, Have a look at verse 27. When the disciples are terrified and they think they've seen a ghost, Jesus says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. He doesn't condemn, but is merciful to those who are doubting. Then in verse 30, when Peter is on the water, he starts sinking and he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus says, no, you shouldn't have doubted and lets Peter drown. That's that's not what it says. Read verse 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. This is the Jesus we can reach to in our need. This is what he is like. Someone phrased it like this. The waves that threatened to be over Peter's head were under Jesus' feet. Our doubts may feel unassailable, but Jesus can handle them. It's not the strength of our faith that holds us to Jesus, but the strength of his faithfulness. And yet, sometimes we're faced with the paradox of Jesus being the one we need most, and yet the one we feel hardest to reach. Is he even there? Is he even listening? It's as if there is a large road ahead closed sign telling us, We can't go to Jesus with our doubt, even though the road is not closed at all. I don't know if you've had that experience. See the sign on the side of the road? I I usually see it as more of a challenge than an instruction. (laughs) Are you sure? I reckon I can probably get around whatever it is. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes it does backfire. I have to turn around and go all the way back. But most of the time, I've found the road actually isn't closed. I don't really know why they put them out, but it's a bit like that here. Um, Though we may hear Satan's lie that we cannot or should not go to Jesus in our doubt, he can't help us, we must press on, remembering the character of Jesus, his tenderness and care towards believers who doubt. We shouldn't be afraid to pray honest prayers that start with, God, I don't know if you're there, but if you are, trusting that God will do his work, even if you don't feel or see anything different. First, go to Jesus. Second, go to his word. Go to his word. Just as important as speaking to Jesus is hearing him speak. Uh, For one thing, it helps us understand a bit more of what Jesus is like, who he is, why we can go to him. But also, we're told the Bible is sufficient for every need, our every need, including the doubts we have. Sometimes we'll find specific verses that are exactly what we need to hear. Um, When I've struggled with assurance in my life, uh, am I really a Christian? Uh, These words from Romans 10 verse 9 have helped me enormously. They say this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible does more than, than give specific answers to specific questions. God's word teaches us how to express our doubts. The book of Psalms is a prime example. God has given us Psalms that start with doubt and end in praise. Perhaps one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 22, starts, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And ends with, They will proclaim his righteousness. He has done it. We need these Psalms to remind us that we won't always be in this place of doubt. God has also given us Psalms that start with doubt 
and stay there. Because he knows his people need songs of lament, words to cry out to God that grieve the brokenness of this world. And yet again, for all the wealth that we can find in scripture, there's another road ahead closed sign. The Bible can't help you here. It's just a book. Might be, might be all made up. And, and we think, oh, I'm not going to read my Bible. Sometimes the, the pages of our Bible just seem like the heaviest objects in the world to turn. Well, if anything like me, I've, I've found listening to something passive, uh, a Bible talk online, uh, Christian music, really helpful in these times. Um, it's minimal effort to just press play on one of these things and just let the words kind of wash over you and um, point you to the scripture that you need to hear. Also, don't, don't be afraid to choose an easy passage to read um, or one of your favorite passages. When we're unwell, we change our diet. We eat the things that we can stomach and that will do us good. It can be similar with spiritual food. You don't have to keep plowing through Jeremiah if you need to go to a gospel or a psalm. God has given us the whole breadth of his word to nourish us in whatever place we're at, however we're feeling. Finally, the, the Bible helps us set realistic expectations. Sometimes we're caused to doubt because we had unrealistic expectations. That the Christian life is going to be all easy, straightforward. That God will answer every prayer that we pray in the way that we expect him to. Um, but the Bible doesn't set those expectations. As someone's put it, um, we need to live on the, the line of Bible expectation. Live on the line of Bible expectation. We shouldn't live below it, thinking God can't do what he said he can, or won't do what he says he will. But neither should we live above it because that can lead us to be unsettled when things don't go the way we have planned. Okay, go to Jesus, go to his word, go to his church, go to his church. Church is God's gift to help those who are struggling in all aspects of life, including Christian doubt. Uh, remember those words from Jude, be merciful to those who doubt. Doubt should be talked about. We should push past push past the road ahead close sign that says doubt is shameful. No other Christian feels like this. It's no different to any other struggle and period of suffering we go through. It is eased by saying it out loud. A trouble shared is a trouble halved. By allowing others to speak truth into our panic, we destroy Satan's plan to isolate us with doubt. Doubt grows in the dark, and so we must bring it into the light to see it for what it is. And by the way, a recent study showed that two thirds of Christians have actually experienced a time of doubt in their life. So that probably makes about 40 or 50 of us in the room. We're not alone. You're not alone. Here's another paradox for you. Your doubting can reassure others. Your doubting can reassure others. Really? How? Well, it can be encouraging for others to know that you're not breezing through life. Like you have all the answers and no doubts whatsoever. Often we will have different doubts to our brothers and sisters. And so actually talking about it, we can help them with theirs and they can help them with us with ours. We can help each other. We do need to be wise though, because um, when we speak of our doubts to others, poss possibly not the best idea to, to broadcast it to many, um, but a, a chosen trusted few um, whose Christian maturity we respect and who aren't also currently going through a period of intense trial. Go to Jesus, go to his word, Go to his church. These are the most reliable pathways out of doubt, always the ones we should go to first. As I've been doing some um, reading on it, I thought I'd just share a few other things which I found really helpful before we close. Number one, when you doubt, remember the truth. Remember the truth. Let me tell you a story. There was a father and a young daughter. They were crossing a stream on some stepping stones. The father is encouraging his daughter across and she's there in the middle of the stream and she looks at the next stone and she thinks i'm not sure that's going to take my weight suddenly she forgets about everything else and seized by the panic that she might not make it across she screams i'm scared what if none of these stones are steady and she looks up she sees her father on the other side smiling it reminds her that she is indeed standing on a stone so that one must be pretty steady. 
And he points back to the ones that she's been on before. Those, those must have held her weight. And then he uh, re finally reminds her that he has gone before her. He steps, he's, te he's tested them out. He steps back across to the one she's looking at and holds out her, his hand to help her across. When we doubt, it has this strange phenomenon of robbing us of all of our truth and security. But we must not forget the things we are confident of in a time of doubt. Maybe good to, to write them down. Or these things I do know, I, I trust these, even if this is a question I'm really struggling with. And when we're in that place, we need to look up, hear our Heavenly Father, hear His words, and, and let Him lead us through. So when you doubt, remember the truth. Number two, doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Sometimes we take the sudden thought in our mind as concrete truth without examining it. But is the alternative to a creator God more believable? What, what are the grounds for believing that prayer doesn't go, uh, that, prayer go, that prayer goes nowhere? What are the grounds for that? What, what are the assumptions behind believing the physical world is all there is? Doubting our doubts help us to apply as much scrutiny to our doubts as we do to our faith. It's only fair. Maybe you haven't made a commitment to follow Jesus yet. It'd be worth doubting your doubts too. Um, Tim Keller wrote this really helpful book. It's called The Reason for God. Uh, let me read you a little section of it. He says these words. He says, if you come to recognize the beliefs on which your doubts about Christianity are based, and if you seek as much proof for those beliefs as you seek from Christians for theirs, you will discover that your doubts are not as solid as they first appeared. In other words, well, examine those things that you thought were true and that are causing doubts about Christian faith. They might not be as secure. Um, I've read this book, so if you, if you want to read it, come and grab it. I've got one, and you can have it if you're the first one. I found it really helpful. Doubt your doubts. A um, couple more. Number three, Christian faith is reasonable. Remember, Christian faith is reasonable. It's not pie in the sky. It's, you don't have to leave your brain at the door when you come in every week. It is built on firm foundations of eyewitness testimony, historical consistency, and careful logic and reasoning. Um, we heard on, on Wednesday, we're going to have part two of Zach's um, look into the biblical evidence, uh, the historical evidence for the Bible. Um, it'd be a great thing to come along to. I really enjoyed the first one. Christian faith is reasonable. We need to remember that, but also we need to remember that Christian faith is faith. We live by faith and not by sight. Um, well, some in the world might think of faith as blind trust in the absence of evidence. I think we as Christians can be tempted to go too far in the opposite direction, give the impression that there is conclusive evidence that proves everything Christians believe, and faith is never hard because we have neat little answers for every question you can think of. That reaction goes actually beyond what can be expected in this present world. There are plenty of things that we can be sure of, but there are also plenty of things we can't. There are many things we base our lives upon which we cannot prove beyond doubt. I can say, my dad loves me. And you can say, well, maybe he's pretending. So you'll give him money and look after him in old age. I can't prove you're wrong, but I know you're wrong based on the evidence. I can't prove to you that Harriet didn't marry me just for my good looks. <laughs> but I have faith in her that she won't leave me when I go bald. <laughs> so the Bible doesn't claim to have the answer to every question you have, but it does claim to be sufficient to equip you for every good work. The Bible doesn't even tell us everything that happened in Jesus's life. In fact, if you ever read the end of John's gospel, he writes that if everything had been written, then the world itself wouldn't have had room for all the books. But more importantly, John also says this. He says, what he's written, he's written, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Um, in a minute, we're going to close with um, a song called I Cannot Tell, which has this kind of sentiment behind it. Um, you'll see the verses start with, I cannot tell, I cannot tell, I cannot tell. And then midway through, they change to, but this I know, but this I know, but this I know. 
Why don't I pray for us and then we can sing this final song. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you um, however we're feeling, um, in the good times or in the bad, when we're feeling confident or when we're feeling in a period of doubt. Thank you that we'll find mercy at your throne of grace and that we can come confident that um, you, Jesus, you love us, you've paid the highest price for us to show the extent of your love for us. We have no fear. Um, please help us, Lord, to um, talk about doubt a little bit more, um, fight through the, uh, the embarrassment or the shame of it that we might feel. Um, help us to, to grow strong as a church here at Manor Road because we um, can help each other in these times. Um, yeah, we pray all these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.